Welcome back. In this last episode on distraction, we'll be covering the information on pages 102 to 109 in the book. We will look at the survival of humans and animals after the flood and specifically, what did they eat? We'll also talk about race and where did all the languages come from? Some people think that there was no food available after the flood other than that which was in the ark, but that is not true. The large amounts of vegetation, including the remnants of trees, which must have been stratted in great masses after the flood, would have made the growth of many types of fungi possible. Fungi? What is that? It's mushrooms. And this could have served as a food source for a wide variety of different organisms for many years. A lot of seaweed must have been left behind in residual pools of water as a major food source. And of course, vast numbers of animals were killed during the flood. Carrion is the decaying flesh of dead animals, and it forms an important source of food during certain seasons. Some of the carcasses could have remained intact as carrion. Others were most likely buried deeply during the flood and may have been exposed later when the flood waters washed enormous quantities of sediments off the continents. Remember, that is called erosion. Various fish could have been trapped in water pools on the continents after the flood waters receded and could have been an additional food source. Since there initially would have been almost no competition after the flood, the population growth of insects, earthworms and rodents must have absolutely exploded. Insects and rodents are legendary for their rapid increase in numbers, especially when no competitors are present. These animals probably comprised the most important fresh food source for a wide variety of animals. Most, if not all, predators will eat rodents, especially when larger prey is not available. Even lions can and will survive for several months by preying on medium to large rodents and rabbits. Now plants, they don't only grow from seeds, but they can also multiply through vegetative propagation. Wow, that's a rather big word. Vegetative propagation is where new plants grow from roots or stems or leaves and where the normal reproductive organs such as the seeds and the flowers are not involved. Why don't you test this yourself? Choose one of your favorite plants. Pick a leaf or you can take a short cutting of let's say five centimeters Place it in water and after just, a after just a few days, it'll begin to grow new roots. As soon as there are enough roots, you can just plant it back into the soil. Now, vegetative propagation could have commenced even before the flood water receded. There is a surprising variety of plants and trees that are able to survive for long periods in a vegetative state, even when they are buried. As an example, we can look at trees that were buried under volcanic ash and after a period of eight years they were dug up and remarkably they started to grow again. Seeds that are in a dormant or resting state can survive as passengers for long periods even when they are soaked in water. For example they could have survived on floating vegetation rafts similar to these floating log mats that were formed in Spirit Lake as a result of the Mount St. Helens eruption. Many seeds could also have escaped the effects of the flood because they were buried in early flood deposits and later exposed by erosion as the soil was washed away. It is of course more than possible that Noah took various kinds of seed on board as well. We know that the dove brought an olive leaf to Noah in the ark, which clearly means that olive trees and possibly a large variety of other plants had already, already begun to grow, even before they ventured out of the ark. Let's now have another look at dinosaurs. Why did they become extinct? Many possibilities have been suggested for their extinction. You can read all about that in chapter 10 of my other book. But this includes a whole range of far-fetched proposals, such as extinction due to shrinking brains, that they simply grew too large, cataracts, sunspots, comets. 
mass suicide. And my personal favorite, chronic constipation. From a biblical perspective, there is no mystery at all regarding the extinction of the dinosaurs. All the dinosaurs, except those in the ark, were destroyed and buried during the flood. The worldwide occurrence of dinosaur graveyards provide clear evidence of this catastrophic event. One pair of every kind of land animal, including dinosaurs as well as birds and pterosaurs, survived in Noah's Ark, filling the earth again after the flood. Since that time, many different animals have become extinct, not only the dinosaurs, as a constant reminder of the serious consequences of sin on creation. After the flood, animals and people began to fear one another which is in harmony with Genesis 9 verse 3, where people were given permission to eat meat. This is why they were hunted to the point of possible extinction. As in the case of the dodo of Mauritius, it is more than possible that dinosaurs became extinct due to human impact, especially since people saw them as such a threat. Where do all the people come from? Let's see what the Bible says about it. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these three the whole earth was populated. How much of the earth was populated from these three? The whole earth was populated from these three. Because of the flood, all people land animals and birds that remained outside the ark drowned. Noah and his family had to start all over again to fill the earth with people. Their children eventually had children and they had more children and their children had even more children and so on until there were millions of people on earth again. Time for a little mathematical calculation. Again, you don't have to run away but for this one you will need a calculator. Have you noticed what happens when you double a small number? Doubling, of course, means we multiply something by two. The numbers will look like this. One times two is two. Two times two is four. Four times two is eight, and so forth. You will soon notice that the number becomes so big that it cannot even fit onto your calculator screen anymore. The human population has grown in much the same way. A few years ago, the human population was increasing at 1.7% per year. This is known as the growth rate and it fluctuates, It means meaning it changes. Currently, it is still over 1% per year. So this actually means the following. Using the 1.7% growth rate would mean that each year, for every 1,000 people, another 17 people are added. It doesn't sound like a lot, does it? Keep in mind that fairly recently there were over 6 billion people on earth and now there are more than 7 billion people. This means that there are over 100 million more people on earth every year. Of course, even using the 6 billion, 6 billion number of people on earth sounds like quite a lot, but did you know that they could all easily fit into a small little country like England and then they each would have about 20 square meters of space around them? We are often told that there are too many people on earth. But this is simply not true. There are definitely not too many people on earth. The real problem is that the people on earth currently are really wasting earth's limited natural resources such as soil, water, gas, coal, plants, animals, oil and so forth and we need these resources to survive. Now we've just spoken about the growth rate of 1.7 percent. If people really lived on earth for only about 1 million years and the population growth 
was at 1.7% per year, there would have been a huge number of people on earth. The number is 1 followed by 43 zeros. And we write it like this, 10 to the power of 43. That is an enormous number. Where are all those people then? If all of them lived upon the earth once upon a time, eventually being buried, then there should be an enormous number of skeletons, human skeletons, in the fossil record. This means that they should have been buried in the earth's sediments, in the sediment layers, where everything else was buried during the flood. But where are they? Even if we believe that they disintegrated, then we should at least find quite a significant number of man-made objects that were buried with them. Where are they? But if we consider the reliable biblical timescale, then everything makes a lot more sense. We begin with eight people. Noah and his wife, the first generation. Their three sons, Sem, Ham and Japheth, and their wives, second generation. And then their children, third generation. After each subsequent generation, there were more people than during the previous generation. The numbers became more and more and more. And furthermore, we only need a growth rate of 0.45% instead of more than 1% today to account for all the people on earth today if it began with only eight. This allows for wars, diseases, famines that might have slowed down the population growth in the past. Now let's look at it considering a growth rate of only 0.45%. And let's assume that the population of eight on Noah's Ark doubled only every 150 years. In other words, we begin with eight. After 150 years, there were 16 people. After another 150 years, there were 32 people. And after another 150 years, there were 64 people, and so on. As you can see, this is a very, very low or slow growth rate. Because in reality, even with disease and famines and natural disasters, the world population currently doubles every 40 years, not every 150 years. But this clearly shows that 4,500 years since the flood was more than enough time to reach the number of people on earth today. Why do I say this? Because at this growth rate, the population of eight would have had to double only about 30 times. We call that exponential growth. Every 150 years to realistically explain a world population of almost 8.6 billion. That's one billion more than the current population of about seven and a half billion people. Clearly, there was more than enough time to reach the current world population. Where do all the different races, more correctly called people groups and languages, come from? The first question we should ask is, are there really different human races? Do you remember when we were strolling through creation week, we learned how Adam named his mate Eve, which means life, and how that was the perfect name for her because she would eventually become the mother of all of humankind. This further means that every single person that has ever existed is family of Adam and Eve. Let's confirm this once again from the word. And he has made from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. In other words, every human being on earth is related to the other. There is only one race, the human race. Let's confirm this further from science as well. Scientists at the National Institutes of Health recently announced that they had put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome. And the researchers had unanimously declared that
There is only one race, the human race. If you ask what percentage of your genes is reflected in your external appearance, the basis by which we talk about race, the answer seems to be in the range of 0.01%. So, we can see that the Bible and science is in agreement that there is only one human race. We shouldn't even talk about race different races, we should rather talk about different people groups. Although people groups vary a lot, we are still quite similar. For example, we all have the same skin coloring pigment responsible for our skin color called melanin. And melanin works like a kind of sunblock. The more melanin you have, the darker your skin would be and the longer it would take for you before you burn in the sun. The less you have, the lighter your skin and the easier or faster you will burn in the sun. So no one really has a black or white skin, but rather more or less melanin. Of course, we have many other things in common too. We all have eyes and ears and noses and hair. Well, maybe not all of us have hair. We also come from the same two people, Adam and Eve, and we are all sinners, which is why we all need Jesus Christ to save us. You see, the real reason why people don't always get along has got nothing to do with skin color, but rather it has everything to do with our sinful and rebellious nature. Where did all the different languages come from? Well, it all began at the Tower of Babel. Once again, people were disobedient to God. They did not listen to him when he said that they should distribute all over the earth and fill it. Instead, they decided to build a huge tower known as the Tower of Babel. This tower would be built to reach right into the clouds. The reason the people built this tower was because they did not trust God's promise to never again punish the world with a worldwide flood. God even placed a rainbow in the sky after the flood as a symbol of his promise. Instead of trusting God, they made a plan to save themselves in case God would not keep his promise. But God decided to easily outsmart them. While they were still happily building away on their little tower of rebellion, God decided then and there to confuse their language. All of a sudden, no one could understand what anybody else was saying anymore. Can you imagine the chaos and Confusion, imagine this scenario. When Liam asked Franku, Franku, gee asjeblief vir my die clip aan jou rechterkant aan. Franku almost snapped his neck as he stared back at Liam, wondering whether Liam had completely lost his marbles. Why would Liam be speaking in such a strange, funny manner? So Franku asked Liam, Qu'est-ce que vous avez dit? Liam responded with, Huh? Adelaide became involved in the conversation and said, Was hast du gesagt? Now Franco and Liam were both confused. Joselito, talking to William, suddenly said, Si lo vuelves a hacer, te vas a arrepentir. William got the fright of his life when he saw Joselito's angry face, but he couldn't understand the word he was saying. What on earth is wrong with you, Joselito? Why are you making these strange noises? Now, Adelaide, Franco, Liam, Joselito and William were completely confused. Fortunately for Liam, Grant heard the conversation and understood what he was saying, so they began a serious conversation trying to figure out why all these people around them were suddenly making these strange noises. It was most frustrating. The one moment they were still happily chatting away and building their little tower of rebellion, and the next moment it was as though nobody could understand a word that the other one was saying. Consequently, they couldn't get any work done, and there the tower stood, half done, incomplete. Confused William still had a frown on his forehead, 
while wondering why everyone was now staring at him in such a strange manner. Why did nobody understand what he was saying? Luckily, Kate stood nearby and she spoke up. William, I don't know what you make of all this, but I suspect these people have gone quite mad. We need to get away from this place at once. Let's grab Margaret to join us, but leave Harry. He sounds awfully confused and usually up to mischief anyway. Liam said, Grant, roep asjeblief vir Etienne, Eila, Jason en Daniel, want het klink of hulle ons daarom verstaan. Kom ons pak ons goed en gaan soek vir ons een mooi plaas ergens waar het lekker warm is. Want as ons hier bly, gaan ons net so mal soos hierdie spul babbelende Babyloniers word. And so the people who understood one another began to group together, eventually moving away to places where they could live and work together without so much confusion. The groups distributed in all directions. Some would have gone to Asia, others to North and South America, some would have gone to Europe, and others would have settled in Africa or Australia. Within these groups, some would have had the same skin color, but there must have been quite a variety of skin colors in each group. More than one of these groups could have reached the warmer parts of Africa and Australia. If there were people in the group with a very light skin color, their skin would have burned faster in the sun than those with a darker skin, since they have less melanin to protect them from the sun. Those who were unable to reach cooler areas with more cloud cover could have contracted skin cancer that would eventually have led to their death. Since skin cancer is treatable today, but in those days people did not have enough medical knowledge to understand why people with lighter skin color became too ill to have children and eventually died after being continuously exposed to the sun. In time, mostly people with darker skin would have survived in Africa and Australia since they were better adapted to those harsh climatic conditions as they had more melanin in their skin. Some people would have moved to the northern parts of Europe where it is much colder and cloudier with far less sunshine during the day. All people need some sunshine on their skin so that they can produce vitamin D. People with lighter skin only need a little bit of sun to do so. But people with darker skin need more sunlight since their darker skin would prevent them from absorbing enough sunlight. Remember, melanin acts as a sunblock. Consequently, people with darker skins would have become very ill in these areas because their bodies would not have been able to produce enough vitamin D. As time went by, the darker skinned people would have died, while people with lighter skin would mostly have been able to survive in these areas with lots of cloud cover, since they were better adapted to those climatic conditions. Interestingly, the Inuit or Eskimos have brown skin, yet they live where there is not much sun. They probably have the same genetic makeup for a medium color skin, yet they don't suffer from vitamin D deficiency since they obtain most of their vitamin D from their diet of predominantly fish. Even though there are so many different people groups and colors and languages in the world today, we are still part of the very same family since we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. The confusion of languages at Babel eventually became a stumbling block in the spreading of the gospel. This is why God blessed specific people in the Christian church with the gift of speaking in tongues without them even having to learn the specific language. Speaking in tongues means to have the gift to speak in a specific, understandable language so that the gospel truth can be clearly understood by all people, nations and tongues. In other words, people from differing languages. The purpose is therefore to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all. The worldwide flood event followed by the relatively smaller impact of glaciers, volcanic activity and subsequent 
drying radically changed the appearance of the world to what we know and see today. In addition to the dinosaurs dying in large numbers, more than 50% of marine organisms died in this disaster. The world today is a mere shadow of what it was before the flood. In the very last presentation, we are going to talk about redemption. I cannot wait to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.